Welcome back to the Freedom Unchained channel. Another lesson from George Gordon, Common Law School. If you guys haven't checked out this course from the beginning, go to the playlist and check it out from the beginning. If you're really interested in learning what law truly is and funnel through all the lies of the government like normal, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so you can get the next video upload. Please also share this video around. Let's start getting the word out for freedom. Of course, leave a comment so the algorithms will help spread this video around. And also support the channel by going to the new page that I set up to help guide the projects that I wish to be working on. So I hope you guys come over there and join me or support me in some way. I'm sure there'll be job postings up for people if they want to help with uh, websites or make articles or whatever skills that you have. I'm sure I can use them. Just get in contact with me. Check out the website. Look out for the mastermind that is going to be built. It's going to be grown as we build it. So a lot of going on, and let's get to George Gordon, Common Law School. Well, greetings, friends. We're looking at lesson four today in the course outline of pro se litigants. What we're gonna to cover today is the jailhouse scene, Miranda versus Arizona, the first half, Davis versus Mississippi, the fingerprint case, and the Ada County jailhouse scene. And let me tell you, I'm probably the most qualified teacher at this school to tell you about the Ada County Jailhouse scene because I've been in there more times than I can remember, at least five to ten times. And you know why I've been in jail? For not having a driver's license, not registering my car. I've been framed. I've been uh, uh, castigated by judges. I've been castigated by the police. And all because I'm demanding my constitutional rights, my inalienable God-given rights. And in order for us, that is the average citizen, to go into the courtroom and argue his position at law on that courtroom floor, you're going to have to know and understand the jail and how the jail works and what kind of intimidation they're going to use against you, how they're going to arrest you because you're demanding your Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. And they're going to take you to jail. And in this state, it's an absolute violation of law to take a man to a state, uh, a man to jail. The law is very emphatic and very specific in Idaho Code 49, 1109, 1110, and, very, and 1111 that in a traffic stop, when there is reason for an arrest, the person must be taken directly to a magistrate except when the person is charged with doing about six items. Drunk driving, leaving the scene of an accident, hit and run, driving under the influence of drugs, etc. Those are the only reasons that you can be taken to jail in the state of Idaho. But policemen in the state of Idaho routinely take people to jail and they do it especially on Friday nights so that they can hold you in jail all of Saturday, Sunday, and then bring you up last thing on Monday. And this is summary punishment by the executive branch of government, and it's done to intimidate you. It's designed and it's calculated by the police to force you, to cause you, to give up your demands for your constitutional rights. And so as I've told my students over the years, if you don't have the kind of intestinal fortitude to go through the jailhouse scene, you can't do this. And as we discussed in lesson one, when you saw Bob tell you what your status was, you know then that the status of a policeman is of a member of society. He is in effect then the servant of a servant. I'm claiming the status of a free and natural person, a merchant and trader at law on a cash basis. The problem that we're having then is that the policeman out there, maybe through no fault of his own, cannot recognize the difference between members, subjects, corporate interests, and free and natural persons. And so they will take the free and natural person and throw him in jail in a summary proceeding to teach him a lesson. Many of these policemen are ex-Marines, and they're used to this thing of just, you will do this because I'm telling you to do it. Now, many of you have probably had this type of harassment by the police or the threat of that type of harassment by the police. 
Today we're going to learn how to deal with and how to handle that harassment. And in order to do this, you need to get in front of you, before we move forward, Miranda versus Arizona. Get your book out. It came in Lesson 1, or it was at Lesson 2. You should have that green book that says Miranda versus Arizona. And you want to pull out, so that you can follow along with me, Davis versus Mississippi. Now, before we get into those, <clears throat> let me then just tell you of one of the experiences that we've had here in Ada County, which goes back to about March of 1982. I was driving my, uh, riding my motorcycle down River Street here in Boise, and a policeman stopped me and came up and he demanded the registration, license, that's the driver's license, and proof of insurance. So I replied to the officer, what's your probable cause? Do you have any reason for stopping me? Do, do I look like the kind of person who doesn't have a driver's license? And the officer immediately became incensed and more belligerent, demanding the driver's license. Well, intimidation is one of the tactics that policemen learn when they go to police school, that you've got to intimidate people. That's why they wear dark glasses. You ever notice that policemen always wear sunglasses so that you can't see their eyes, you can't see them shift, you can't see the nervousness, the apprehension that the policeman is actually suffering under? All right. So Officer uh, Schmedley, we'll call him, uh, said, if you don't show me the driver's license, I'm going to arrest you. Well, wait a minute, Officer Schmedley. Are you going to arrest me and take me to a magistrate, or are you going to exercise police powers and summary judgment and take me to jail? I'm going to take you to jail, Officer Smedley told me. Well, Officer Smedley, let me tell you that pursuant to Idaho Code 491109, you're commanded to immediately take me to a magistrate, and I'm demanding that you take me to a magistrate. And I demand all of my rights at law and waive none of my rights at any time for any cause or reason, including my right to time. And if you do not take me to a magistrate, you're in the process of committing a felony under Title 41, or excuse me, Title 18, Section 241 of the U.S. Code. Now, the reason for telling him that right then and there was so that he would be forewarned not to do that. Remember, the policeman has to tell you what your rights are, doesn't he? Doesn't he have to say you have the right to remain silent and anything you say can and be, will be used against you in a court of law? Well, then the courts are just as stringent upon you telling the officer what crime he is about to commit or is in the process of committing. That being the case, you need to make the demand for your rights. Demand your rights right off the bat. And don't ever forget that statement. Here it is. And if you don't have it, memorize, write it down, and carry it with you. This is your demand of rights. Officer, judge, whoever you're speaking to in whatever form, I demand all of my rights at all times. And I do not waive any of my rights at any time, including my right to time. Now the officer went ahead and arrested me and took me out to jail. So we get into the jailhouse scene. The first thing you've got to re recognize in jail is that the purpose there is to gain psychological control over you. And I'm going to show you from Miranda versus Arizona how the Supreme Court shows us how to use our Fifth Amendment rights, how the Supreme Court of the United States views an individual when he goes into the jailhouse scene or when he is confronted by a peace officer, police officer. The problem that you're facing isn't that you're the criminal. The problem is that we have criminals in uniforms with guns on their hips and badges on their chests running around violating our rights, which are felonies. And these people are acting, for the most part, with good conscience. They think they're doing right, when in fact they are a worse criminal. Here's a man committing a felony violating my civil and constitutional rights, the supreme law of the land, trying to enforce a tax regulation pursuant to interstate or intrastate commerce. And here I am now in jail, and here's this officer claiming that I'm some kind of a criminal because I don't have a driver's license registration or proof of insurance. So I sat down, <clears throat> and after a little while, they said to me, uh, All right, Gordon, come on over here. We're going to book you in. And they're a little crude, and they're a little calloused, you know, when they make these commands. You know, they sound like... Uh, a sergeant on a 
uh, in boot camp. And I said, now, wait a minute. Uh, let me see if I understand what's happening here. What is it that you're proposing to do to me? All right, Gordon, let's not have any of your smart lip. Get over here. We're going to take your fingerprints and shoot your picture. Oh, wait a minute. Are you, are you telling me then that you're going to take against my will and over my objection my fingerprints and my photograph? There's a little pause about the time this happens. Sometimes they'll become angry. Sometimes they'll sit back and they'll wonder what's coming next. Well, in my case, I said, now, I'm demanding, pursuant to Idaho Code 49-1109, that you take me directly to a magistrate. And I'm demanding a court order pursuant to Davis versus Mississippi. I want you to obey the law. Oh, that'll just blow their minds. And then they come unglued and they begin threatening you and... In my case, they two great big uh, ex-Marines grabbed me and drug me across the floor, and they said, all right, we're taking your prints. I doubled up my fists like this. Are you going to beat me like you did Miranda? Are you going to kill me in here like they're doing in Los Angeles? Are you going to harm me in some way and steal my property against my will and over my objection? Do you notice the statements that I'm using? These statements, when you're actually in the confrontation, sound ridiculous. They sound insane. But let me tell you, these demands for rights and these questions that you're asking are absolutely necessary and imperative for your offensive move, which comes under Title 42, Section 1983. Remember, when you go to sue the sheriff and the deputies for beating you up or depriving you of your rights, you're going to have to go into the courtroom and you're going to have to prove that it was Officer Smedley, Officer O'Neill, Officer Jones who did these acts to me. And you're going to have to put them on the witness stand. And you're going to have to examine them. And they're going to have to sustain cross-examination. You're going to have to introduce evidence, documentation, witnesses. And so when you're in the jail, you're actually demanding your rights in hopes that they will not give them to you. Another tactic that you use is this. Listen to this little ploy, and then I'll get back to the point. Officer, I demand paper and pencil so that I can write a writ of habeas corpus. I'm being detained against my will and over my objection illegally and unlawfully, and therefore I want a writ of habeas corpus to go before any magistrate. Will you help me do that? No. I never found one yet that would get me a pen and paper. But I'll tell you, they don't beat me up and they don't take my fingerprints anymore. And uh, I've noticed now in Ada County that we have a big change in the way our law enforcement personnel deal with people who demand their rights. And wherever you are, whether you're in Illinois or Pennsylvania, the initial shock of the first five or six patriots who pose this, con uh, this confrontation to your local sheriff and to the state police pursuant to Miranda versus Arizona and uh, Davis versus Mississippi, they're going to come unglued and there's going to be some people get hurt and I'm going to show you how to handle this. But after the initial shock, they'll back off and recognize when they do a little re legal research that they have indeed violated the law. And then they'll be panic-stricken wondering when this Title 42 suit is going to come down. And let me tell you, when the first Title 42 suit is filed in your county, you're going to see a real difference in the way your law enforcement officers deal with you. Now, remember, this is the very first confrontation in Ada County. George Gordon is in the jail. George Gordon will not give them his fingerprints, and he's demanding Fifth Amendment protection. Those fingers right there belong to you. And those fingers have incriminating evidence or potential criminating, incriminating evidence that could be used against you. Now remember, at this juncture of time, you're not convicted of any crime. And at this point in time, you should have been demanding counsel, probable cause, and to be taken to a magistrate. Because remember, under the counsel issue, you have a right to counsel. And one of the first things under the Miranda Doctrine that the policeman's got to tell you is that you have a right to counsel. So watch what happens. <clears throat> you're in the jail. You're there without counsel. You won't sign anything. And you're demanding that you have protection of your fingerprints pursuant to the Fifth Amendment. 
until you get a court order ordering you to give these fingerprints. And here's the reason for that. Let's suppose you jumped ship and that you're really a fugitive from the uh, military service in some way. And uh, you know that your fingerprints, you know, are in computers all over the country and that if you give them the fingerprints because they hauled you to jail because you didn't have a driver's license, that now they're going to find out you're guilty of a felony or at least you're charged or there's a fugitive warrant for you. Did you want to give them that information? You don't have to. But you know, most people, when they walk in the jail and the policeman demands of them, what's your name? Who wants to know? Where do you live? I want counsel. I don't want to make any incriminating statements. I don't want to tell you anything. I want counsel of my choice, and my counsel's name's Bob Hallstrom, and his telephone number is 336-5272. When I have counsel here, we'll talk about whether or not I'm going to sign something. Now, they've got this fingerprint program. And the fingerprint program, to my knowledge, is perfectly lawful and legal. There's nothing wrong with a person giving up his rights. You can be conned and, and uh, coerced into giving up your Fifth Amendment rights if you want to. But you have to understand that Fifth Amendment rights belong to the belligerent claimant in person. Now, I'm going to read to you that statement from your United States Supreme Court. Take your book entitled Legal Quotations and turn here with me to page 32. I'm going to show you one of the most, the most uh, surprising, if that's the right word, I think that's an understatement, statements made by the Supreme Court of the United States that you're going to read. The privilege against self-incrimination is neither accorded to the passive resistant nor the person who is ignorant of his rights not to one who is indifferent thereto. It is a fighting clause. Its benefits can be retained only by sustained combat. It cannot be claimed by an attorney or a solicitor. It is valid only when insisted upon by a belligerent claimant in person. That's why I tell my students, when you're in the jailhouse scene, if you cannot become a belligerent claimant in person, you cannot have your Fifth Amendment rights. And as I tell people, I don't know if that's right or wrong or good or bad. The purpose of our school here is not to change law. You know, people are constantly uh, accusing me of being a communist and accusing me of trying to change the uh, social order and and promote abortion and promote uh, wickedness and evil in high places. and That's all poppycock. I'm a businessman. Nothing more, nothing less. I'm interested in law for the sake of law. What is the law and how does it apply? I want to know what my Fifth Amendment rights are and then I want to know how do I get what I own. If I own it, I want it. I want to, I want to possess it. I've got to have it. And in order to have it, my Supreme Court tells me I have to be a belligerent claimant in person and that my lawyer can't get it for me. All right? Now, remembering then that we're not here to tell you that if you would accept my philosophy and my beliefs and join my group and send me your money, that somehow we'll go up here to Congress or our state legislature and we'll change these laws and we'll make the world a better place. I say to that, it's just so much poppycock. Individual rights come to the belligerent claimant in person, and he has to claim them on the courtroom floor. When you're a big mob of people, like a union, you get redress of grievance by creating law under the king's statutes in the legislature by lobbying. And that puts you in the majority, and the majority doesn't need any protection from constitutional deprivation of rights by law enforcement or executive officers. It's the minority. It's me. It's just plain George who's in that jail who has to demand his right to his Fifth Amendment. Now, you can extrapolate that one step further. If it covers the Fifth Amendment and you have to be a belligerent claimant in person, then what do you have to be when you want your Fourth Amendment right? And the guy knocks on your door and says, I've got a warrant and I'm coming in. Don't you have to stand in the door? Don't you have to deny him entrance? Don't you have to challenge the warrant? Don't you have to put your rights statement into the picture right there so that when you get him on the stand in a Title 42 suit, you can say, now, officer, 
When you broke down my door and stepped in, didn't I tell you that that warrant failed and that I challenged it and that you did not have my permission to come in? That's what you're needing when you get into the jailhouse scene or any confrontation. Admissions and confessions, because remember, 90% of all of the convictions in the United States come from admissions and confessions, and you'll read that in the Miranda book. <clears throat> So here's your policeman over there. He's demanding your fingerprints, and there's about five of them, and two of them have grabbed you. They've hauled you over there, and you're telling them plainly in front of about five or six. In my case, I think there were six or seven uh, deputies, and the sheriff himself was standing there, and a deputy was there, and the deputy said, no, it was uh, Sheriff Palmer said, take his prints, book him in. And the deputy said, don't make any marks. Well, I'm not too bright, but when I heard that fellow tell me don't make any marks, I kind of figured it was going to hurt. All right? But remember, there's another thing that, that uh, is built into every human body. Not only do you have a mind to think with, but also the physical body can only take so much pain and then it becomes unconscious. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to be a masochist in some way, but I'm telling you that you've got to have a lot of grit and a lot of gall. If you don't, you don't want to be the first guy to take on your county sheriff because the first two or three times, they're going to get rough. But they're not going to beat you and make marks on you. They're not going to hit you with, with their fists and their nightclubs and their billy clubs and their flashlights and etc. Because there's too many witnesses involved here and even the police don't know how many of their own troops they can depend upon to tell the same lie and get it straight. And in later lessons, when we talk about cross-examination, I'm going to show you how to put a man on the stand, and the best thing that can happen to you is when he starts to lie. Now, let me tell you, when I'm on that courtroom floor and I get somebody telling me the truth, I become very dejected. I just like a policeman to start lying because I'll lead him right down the primrose path and I'll hang the back before he knows what's happened to him. And that's the way that comes down. And that's the way you're going to have to learn how to do it. You're going to develop a killer instinct. Now, if you're the average housewife from CUNA, as I call her, who's just uh, a nice lady and, and who's uh, passively interested. Now, remember what the Supreme Court said about this passive interest? Let's study this for a moment. Page 32. The privilege against self-incrimination isn't accorded to the passive resistant. So if you're a passive resistant, let me tell you, you're, you're out to lunch. You're not going to be able to get your rights. You might as well just remain a subject or a member, pay your taxes, obey your masters, and shut your mouth. Free men have got to demand their rights, and they've got to do it by sustained combat. Now, you can sit there and say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Oh, well, I don't know how it should be. I'm just telling you the way it is. Now, that case, by the way, is called United States versus Johnson, and it comes from 76 Federal Supplement, page 538. And you've got the book, so if you want to go read the case, go read the case for yourself. It would be a good exercise for you if you picked it up and, and studied a little bit. Now, you understand where you're at. If you want your rights, you're going to have to, through sustained combat, become a belligerent claimant in person and demand them. That doesn't mean that you can say, well, gee, I wish you wouldn't take my fingerprints. Oh, here's my hand. Because... If that's your attitude, if that's your position, uh, you're not going anywhere in this pro se movement to claim and demand your rights. What you're going to have to do is wait until the competent pro se's secure your rights for you and then hope that your masters will obey the law and let you participate in some of the spoils. Meanwhile, back on the farm, uh, I go to jail every once in a while, but when I go to jail, I'm there gathering evidence, interviewing prisoners, documenting facts, taking down officers' names and badge numbers. And if you don't think that drives those fellows right up the wall, what will I tell you some of the story? Because not only is this serious business, it's also a fun business. And as I tell people, if you're not having fun in the jail, then you're not doing it 
correctly. Now the officers put their arm around my neck and choked the windpipe until I couldn't breathe. Now, it's obvious that when you can't breathe in about 60 to 120 seconds, you're going to lose consciousness. If you lose consciousness, they'll probably take your fingerprints. And you don't want that now, do you? So here's the way I handle that. The guy chokes me and I can't breathe, so I hold my breath there for about 30 seconds. Now, he's got my hand and I open it up, right? Now, he takes my finger and I'm bent into all kinds of contortions. There's six guys holding me. They've got my arm twisted behind my back, and it's hurting bad. And so he takes fingerprint number one, and then he takes fingerprint number two, and then about that time, because I'm cooperating, he takes his arm away from my neck, and I take two breaths as he takes fingerprint number three, and then when he gets down to the little finger, I jerk and screw up the whole card. Boy, if you don't think that's going to get their attention. Boy, now they really get mad at you. Now they choke you again. Make sure that as you jerk, you've already inhaled. <sighs> you see how that goes? Now, <clears throat> they have to get a new fingerprint card, and that's going to take a couple of minutes. So now you just relax. Don't resist. And while they're getting the new card, you're breathing now, aren't you? Okay? Now you're breathing for a while. They get a new card in there. And boy, you should hear some of the language that's going on. You know, you blankety blank, so and so, and blah, blah, blah. And you know, this goes on. Same scene, act two. Fingerprint number one, fingerprint number two. And depending upon how much air you've got, <laughs> you jerk it and screw up the card again. See how that goes? All right. Now, after a while, they will take the smudges and give up in disgust. About the third or fourth card, they'll quit. Because... Like anybody else, they get discouraged. And it depends upon how belligerent a claimant you are. And you've just won your first battle of the jailhouse scene. Your government officials now have arrested you. They've done so in violation of the law. And, of course, you're going to have to check your own state statutes to find out whether or not it's a violation of law and what they can arrest you for. But basically, you cannot be arrested in a traffic case unless you've done something to damage someone's life, liberty, or property. There has to be a common law action in order to be arrested. Okay, now they grabbed me and drug me in, and they put this chain around my neck with this little card on it, and it said George Gordon, and it had these numbers on it, one thing and another, and they want to take my picture. Now, that picture that they're going to take can be subpoenaed, and it can be produced in a civil case as evidence of police brutality. And so can the fingerprint card. You see, everything that you do in there has to be designed for the express purpose of gaining evidence and causing them, if you will, to violate your rights. In other words, sometimes the police won't violate your rights because they're not smart enough to do that. And so you're going to have to help them a little bit. And in order to help the policeman violate your rights, you have to make certain demands. I don't want you to take my picture because it's a violation of my religious ideology pursuant to the First Amendment. Now, what have you told six people there? Ah, oh, shut up, dummy! And they grab you and they throw you down in this seat and they've got this badge on you here. What do you do? You try to get up. You don't sit there and let them take your picture. And so here's the guy trying to take your picture. Now, two of these big Marines, you know, push you down and hold you, and then you turn your head off to the side. Now what do they got? How are they going to take your picture like that? Now they've got to have big hands right here, don't they? And when they got those big hands, you make a big face like... The ugliest contortion that you can produce when they snap that picture each and every time. That picture is evidence of police brutality taken with their own camera. And you see what we're doing? You see why I tell you you've got to have the killer instinct? Because you know if you're just an average housewife from CUNA, you're just going to sit there and take the picture. And while they're doing it against your will and over your objection, you get into the courtroom in a civil action, and the policeman gets up on the stand. He says, gosh, uh, we were just as nice and gentle with her. Why, she sat down and we snapped her picture pursuant to our code. And gosh, they're just everything was fine and there was no problem at all. And, 
Mrs. Baumwortle was just a wonderful subject and she was a model prisoner and we didn't have any problem with her at all. And here you are trying to convince this jury that these people have violated your rights and that they've committed a felony under Title 18. Uh, oh, you don't think police lie? Well, let me tell you, I've been doing this for five years. And I've argued 35 cases, and 33 of them are criminal. And of the 33 criminal cases, I've probably dealt with 50 policemen on the witness stand, and there's only one man with a badge on who ever told the truth on the witness stand. And I'm going to tell you his name because, you know, I think that you ought to know that. His name is Richard D. Leonard. I'm not going to tell you who lied. I'm just going to tell you the one man who told the truth. You know how long he was on the witness stand? Five minutes. And uh, in the five minutes, I asked him about uh, ten questions, and in the ten questions, he told the truth, and the judge dismissed the charge, which is just exactly what he should have done because uh, there was no charge and it was false and malicious. Now, there's my first experience. About two weeks later, I was arrested for the same charges. You know, I'm sort of notorious around my own bailiwick. I think it's pretty well known in this county and in this state that George Gordon doesn't have a driver's license, doesn't register his car, there's no license plates on it, and I don't insure it, and I'm not going to, and I haven't, and I don't intend to ever start. And if you want to argue the issue, let's take it to Washington. So we had the same policeman arrest me again, and this time in my automobile. And he's just really uptight because there's no license plates, and so... Same scene, Act 2. Here's the way that one comes down. Here we are in a private parking lot. Whenever you're in your car, get it off the public road. Don't stop until you can pull it onto private property somewhere. And then ask the party if you can park your car there. So I pulled it into a business parking lot. And the officer says, I want your driver's license, registration, and proof of insurance. And to which my reply is, I want probable cause, a Fourth Amendment warrant, and a lawyer present during all stages of this interrogation. Exclusionary rule goes up right then and there. You have an interrogation, you have the exclusionary rule. Well, in this state, we have a very interesting statute here. You see, it says in Idaho Code 49-317, all licensed drivers shall, upon demand of a peace officer, produce his driver's license. That's right. I agree with that. I think that's a good law. I think all licensed drivers, upon demand of a peace officer, should be compelled to produce their license. Now, what do you do if you're not a licensed driver? Are you going to throw the unlicensed driver in jail and punish him without due process of law? Are you going to uh, deny him counsel at the scene? Are you going to interrogate him? Are you then going to punish him without... Uh, without a right to cross-examine his accusers, etc., because he doesn't have a driver's license? Now, when we get into the driver's license issue, I'll tell you more about why it is that the driver's license compels you into specific performance. But for the moment, let's just say that I'm fully persuaded that I'm not a person required to have a driver's license. Now, the officer gets angry. And uh, I don't know why. I said, did you want to know who I was? It was the same policeman. He's going to have a real hard time in the courtroom trying to defend malicious abuse of power. I mean, the first time he arrested me, he could say, well, I didn't know who the guy was. But the second time, I mean, is there any doubt? And let me tell you, friends, there isn't anybody in the state of Idaho in law enforcement that hasn't heard the name George Gordon, Robert Hallstrom, or Nealus Cook. All right, so here's the policeman, throws the handcuffs on me, hauls me out to the jail again, see? All right, here we are. Now we've got... Scene 2, Act 1 of the jailhouse scene, two weeks later. Now, they have a policy in Idaho pursuant to Idaho Code 19-4812 and 4813, which is the police regulations, that they have to take fingerprints, oh, listen to this, if possible, yeah, that's right, if possible, from every arrested person. I agree with that. I think that the police should take fingerprints from every arrested person, if possible. But what do you do, Mr. Policeman, if it isn't possible? What if the citizen demands his rights? Then what do you do? Beat him up? Oh, yeah, that's right. They beat you up again. So the second scene comes in, and you make all the same demands. Hold it. 
I demand to be taken to a magistrate pursuant to statute. Wait a minute. I demand all of my rights at law and waive none of my rights. All right, so you go through your routine again. Are you going to beat me up and choke me unconscious like you did the last time? Most of these police departments have video cameras hidden away and they're taking your picture. Make certain that you note the time of day and the date so that you can then subpoena any evidence that they might have, videotape, for instance. In addition, you can then subpoena the documents that are the records of who's on duty at that time, their personnel records, so that you can get the names of all the officers who are on duty and who could have, one, perpetrated the, the crime against you, beat you up, taken your fingerprints, etc., or... They can just be witnesses. How valuable is a witness who is, uh, in my case, there was a lady jailer and she was up in the control room watching everything that happened. Don't you think I want her on the witness stand? Don't you think I want to ask her what happened? Did you hear Mr. Gordon demand to be taken to a magistrate? Uh, yes, I believe he did. Did you uh, hear Mr. Gordon demand all of his rights at law and never waive them? Well, yes, I think he did. Now where have you got the police? You see how important it is? When you go to jail, you're not there as a victim. You're there as a belligerent claimant gathering evidence. You're not a victim who's a uh, passive housewife from CUNA. You're there to gather evidence, to get information, names, dates, times, places. And then, when they've completed the booking process, then they may get your fingerprints. You don't know. In my case... They did get a bunch of smudges the first time. Now listen to how this came down. The next morning, which in this state is mandated by statute, they bring you to the magistrate the next day, and the magistrate reads the charges, and in your case, you've been arrested, so you didn't sign the ticket. And the magistrate says, Now, Mr. Gordon, I have before me three charges by Officer Schmidley. Officer Smedley alleges that, and he'll tell you you didn't have a driver's license, registration, proof of insurance, and this whole process takes about five minutes as he goes through this somber ritual of telling you what a criminal you are. Now he finishes and he says, uh, Mr. Gordon, do you understand the charges? Your Honor, I have some administration, administrative and procedural matters to bring up. Now note those words down. Your Honor... I have some administrative and procedural matters to take up prior to the pleading. Okay. <clears throat> now, the judge, by law, by rule of the court, has got to listen to the defendant. If he doesn't, then just be quiet. Don't say a word. Let him babble on for a while, because a lot of traffic court judges are just laymen who don't understand law. Don't blame them, because they're ignorant. And he'll blather on for a while, and then there comes a point in time when he has to let you speak, because after all, he can't convict you, he can't enter a guilty plea for you. He has to say uh, something on your, I'm not going to listen to any of this uh, frivolous nonsense. And I'm not going to let you disrupt the court. And, you know, he'll get real serious here about this time, and you just relax. Comes back and he says, now, uh, how do you plead to these charges? Uh, excuse me, Your Honor, uh, are you going to deny me my right to defend myself and to speak in my own behalf. Now, about the second or third time that you lay that trip on him, he's going to shut up. No, Mr. Gordon, I'm going to, I'm going to extend you every courtesy, and he'll preach a little sermon here about this time. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate the opportunity that the court is allowing me here to defend myself because the first thing that I need to bring up as a matter of administrative and procedural matter is those jailers beat me unconscious in there and extracted confessions and admissions from me against my will and over my objection in violation of the Miranda Doctrine. And I want the record to clearly show that anything that I've said in that jail to the officers, to anybody, any evidence, videotape, any uh, uh, audio tapes, any conversations, any words, sentences or phrases that came out of my mouth, either allegedly or actually, I'm demanding that those be excluded as evidence in any future litigation against me in a criminal matter. Okay. See your first statement on the record? You've disclaimed everything that happened in there, but more importantly, you have an official court document, a record. What did you just tell them? They beat me unconscious in there. 
Now, what are you going to do with that? You're going to demand that record. In most courts, it's a tape recording. You may have to pay the $3. In this state, it's $3.50 to get the tape recording. Get it and tuck it away. You won't use that evidence for a long time. But in the gathering of evidence in that jail, they're not going to be giving you pad and paper. You're, going, you're an undercover agent is what you really are. And you're going to have to work, in some cases, with no pencils. They'll throw you in a jail cell. Hey, buddy, would you give me a pen or a pencil? Would you help me write this down? In some cases, you'll have to tear toilet paper off and use a pencil to write down pertinent data, facts, and information. You may even have to smuggle it out of the jail. I'll get to that in a moment. Well, I created, on the record, the documentation that my allegation was under threat, duress, and coercion, that I had been beaten unconscious, that they had taken my fingerprints from me against my will and over my objection. And note those words down because they also come from the Supreme Court. Against your will and over your objection. Here's why. Just as Hugo Black once observed or commented, failure to object is fatal. All right? And a parallel phrase that goes like this. Failure to demand your rights waives your rights. Now, here again, I hear so many patriots complain. Well, it shouldn't be that way. And those dirty commie pinko judges, well, it's like I said before, I don't know if it's right or wrong or good or bad. I'm just telling you that that's the way it is. Now, maybe if we want to legislate or we want to lobby our legislators or we want to get laws and rules passed that are going to change uh, status to or issues from demanding rights to automatically giving them to the slaves. I don't know. You decide whether or not you want to do that in Illinois or Maine or Texas. I don't know, and I'm not even going to get involved in it. I'm telling you right now that if you don't demand your rights, you've lost them. And that's the end of that argument. And you can sit here and argue until you get to Washington, D.C., and Chief Justice Berger is going to tell you the same thing. You didn't object timely. You didn't demand your rights, so therefore it's waived. And they'll sit there and quote a string of cases like Garner and McCullough and say that's the end of the argument. Next issue, Mr. Gordon. You don't want to get into that position. Now, they're going to take you down and put you in your jail cell. Now, in my case, they really got uptight with me and they threw me in solitary confinement. They're going to punish me. Now, you must always be psychologically in control. Once you've lost psychological control, you're jelly in the hands of your captors. So they took me down. They threw me in this little cell. Now, there was another issue involved here concerning the jail suit. I said, are you going to steal my clothes and strip me naked? And they did. Boy, they stripped me right down naked, and they poured me into one of these coverall jail suits. And as soon as they let go of me, I poured myself right back out of that jail suit, and there I was standing in my BVDs. And so they sent me down to a uh, solitary confinement cell, and I think I paced it off. It was uh, three paces in one direction, which is about nine feet by four, so I think it was about nine by twelve. Had a bunk in there, metal, no mattress, no blankets. You know, I was uncooperative and belligerent. Now they were going to punish me. They were going to teach me a lesson. And remember now, this is Friday afternoon. They always arrest you on Friday so that they can keep you over the weekend. So always be prepared to go to jail on Friday. They're not going to do it to you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I've been arrested five to ten times in the state of Idaho and thrown in jail. Never been put in jail yet on any other day than Friday. Now, isn't that coincidental? I contend that that's malicious abuse of power and harassment, but trying to prove that, you know, is extremely difficult. So don't sit there and get gastric indigestion over issues that you can't prove. Concentrate on those things that you can prove. Now watch how this scene comes down. Here I am in my little jail cell. <clears throat> I pasted off, tried the doors, and found out that I wasn't going to leave there without some external help. Now, I got my mind on the room and on what I was going to do next. Quit worrying about your wife and your kids. There isn't anything you can do for them anyway. Don't worry about whether or not you're going to cook your husband's dinner tonight because the answer is you're not going to. They got you locked in this little room and you're not getting out. That's like being trapped on the planet Earth. You know, a guy could get real 
uh, real uptight about that. You know, if you got real concerned about it, don't you understand that you're trapped on the planet Earth and you can't get off of it? Oh, now you're starting to see the picture. Oh, there's your little world right there in that room, isn't it? Well, then why don't we go forth and conquer that room? Now, there's one thing that your jailers will al almost always capitulate to, and that's a Bible. They won't let you have Playboy or Penthouse, but they will almost always let you have a Bible. And so when the jailers come by, you say, uh, Sir, would you get me a Bible? And in my case, they locked me up about Easter, so I said, Hey, did you know that uh, Passover is tomorrow night and I need a Bible? Would you get one of those for me? And so the jailer went out and got a Bible. Why do you do that? Because you've got to have something to read. Because remember, in solitary confinement, let me tell you, you've got nothing to do but to sit there and think. And in addition to that, now I've got no mattress. Never ask your captors for anything. I wouldn't ask them for a toothpick. What you do is you sit quietly. The Bible is the only thing you're going to ask for. Don't ask for reading material. What they love to have you do is ask for a toothbrush. Well, I'll take it up with the lieutenant. Uh, hey, I need soap, and I'm cold, and I need a towel. That's just what they wanted to hear you say. I'm cold. Now they'll turn the, the air conditioner on. Uh, uh, tell them I'm too hot. Would you turn the air conditioner on? And they'll turn it off. They'll do anything they can to persecute you. So whatever it is you ask for, they're going to do the exact opposite. So here's the way you handle it. If you're hot, what you do is tell them, gosh, I'm awful cold. Would you please turn the heat up? Because then they're going to turn it off or they're not going to do anything. Now, typically, they don't do anything, but they will do whatever they can to antagonize you, and uh, you're going to be frustrated. And I was in jail a number of times, and, and there's these poor people in there. They're kicking the doors and screaming and yelling, and they just come unglued, you see, because they're not trained, they're not instructed, they don't know how to deal with this. And they're certainly, while they're yelling and screaming, not taking down the officer's name and and uh, the circumstances and the times and the dates and the places. And so here I am, and about 11 o'clock that night, some jailer came down with a mattress and one blanket. Okay? So now I've got a mattress, but I didn't ask them for it. They brought it. But you know what they forgot to do? <laughs> this is hilarious. I was in there for about three days. I think I was in there on Friday, and then Saturday came. Actually, I think I was, uh, yeah, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday came, and and uh, in this particular case, I was in there on a Thursday also. I think I was carried over, and this was a second uh, charge. Sometimes they'll get you in jail now, and they'll bring other charges. See, they'll charge you on one thing, and then on Monday, when you're in there, they'll bring new charges, and then they'll hold you till Tuesday to arraign you for that, and then they'll hold you again for Wednesday's arraignment for another charge, like obstructing and delaying, you know, things like that. Be prepared for that. And you're going to have to steal yourself and you're going to have to be tough because this process takes about six or eight months. And the first two or three of you who go through this are going to be the trailblazers for everyone else. Because in this county, and I, as we get to the end of this lesson, I'll show you how much fun this gets. See, they don't, they don't arrest people in this county anymore because they don't have driver's licenses. Yeah, they learned that that's against the law. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. But now... Watch what happens. Here I am. I'm in my little jail cell in here. I've got my Bible to read. I exercise for a half hour at a time. And when the jailers come in, I, I do this every time. I don't ask them for anything. I make demands. Uh, officer, now watch when he comes in. I've got no pen. I've got no paper. I don't even have toilet paper at this point in time. Officer, I need to write a writ of habeas corpus. Will you help me get a pen and paper and write a writ of habeas corpus? I'll talk to the lieutenant. Steal that dummy's name right into your brain. Officer Smedley, Officer O'Houlihan, or whoever he is. Now, you don't have a clock. You don't have a watch. You don't know what day it is. And sometimes you won't even know what the date is. Date or the, uh, the, the day or the time. Do the best you can. Ask them, what day is today? Oh, it's Sunday. Is this Easter Sunday? Yeah, that's right. Make mental notes of meal times because meal times are set. What relationship did this event occur to breakfast and lunch? About halfway in between? Was it between lunch and dinner? Was it after dinner or before dinner? That's the way you'll help yourself remember it because you're going to be there three or four days. All right, so on Easter Sunday morning, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, now how, 
how can I best create stark terror among my jailers? Ah, I know what I'll do. Now, I've been in there for three or four days, haven't I? So I'm, I'm in there in my shorts, and by now I'm starting to stink, you see, because they've got me in solitary, and they won't let me go out and take a shower like everybody else. So I decided that I'd take my underwear off and wash them in my sink. So I took a little piece of paper off of one of my tickets that they'd given me, and I put it in the bottom of the sink, and I filled it up with hot water, and I washed my underwear. Now I'm standing there in my T-shirt, right? Okay. Now I take my T-shirt off, and I hear the door clang. Hey, wait a minute. Let me use my head here. Watch this thing. It's lunchtime. And they push the little cart down there to give me my lunch. I strip my shirt off, and I take my underwear. See? And I'm standing there now, right in front of the door, front and center, stark naked. Got that? Stark naked. And this trustee who comes around the corner stands in front of my door, which has a glass in it, and his mouth dropped open. As he gaped through the window looking at this man who's stark naked, standing there with his underwear. And what's he doing with his underwear? Oh, watch this. He stands there. If I can get my, my handkerchief out here. And I'm washing my face. About this time, the guard comes around the corner because this poor fellow is standing there gaping, wondering what's happening, and the door starts to open because they're electric doors. And the guard comes around the corner, and he's standing there going, oh. And what am I doing? Is there any reason why I can't keep clean? Is there some reason why you've deprived me of soap, toilet paper, towels, blankets? and the necessities of life. You, you, you mean you don't have soap? And he came into the cell. Uh, no, uh, I don't have any soap, and I haven't had any for three or four days. I, I don't even know what day it is in here, and I don't have any towels, and I haven't had a shower for so long I can't remember when. Now, why am I saying that? Let me think about this for a moment. They've deprived me of the basic essentials of life, which you can't even do, pursuant to the Geneva Conference, to a prisoner of war who's a trained killer. Now, what am I in jail for? I'm not even convicted of a crime. I'm being held in jail so that I can be brought to a magistrate on Tuesday because Sundays and holidays accepted. And remember, Easter Sunday, Monday is a holiday, and so the courts are closed on Monday, and I'm not coming out till Tuesday, and I'm in there a total of five days, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm in there five days held on charges that aren't even chargeable. In Idaho, you can't put a man in jail because he doesn't have a driver's license. They didn't allege that I was drunk driving. You know, if I was the policeman, I'd be screaming, yeah, I caught that guy out there, he's drunk. At least get a little class, you know, use a little intelligence. Now they've got me in jail. Now I've got the trustee standing there. About this time, the second trustee can't keep his curiosity down. He comes around the corner. Now we got the jail guard at the lunch break on Easter Sunday morning of 1982 and two trustees who were kitchen trustees who delivered the food to solitary confinement on that day. Can I find out who they are? You bet. Did I? You bet. I've got it documented. And I'm ready to go to trial on that issue. And when I put those trustees on the stand... And on Easter Sunday morning at about 11.30, did you have occasion to observe the defendant, George Gordon? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, what did you see when you saw him at lunchtime? Well, he was standing in there naked. Naked? Well, let me see if I understand it. You came in at lunch and the defendant, Gordon, a prisoner in the Ada County Jail, was standing before you stark naked? You mean he didn't have jail clothes? No. Uh, he didn't have underwear? No, he said that he had to wash him because he hadn't had any soap for four or five days. He couldn't remember when he had a shower last. I asked the guard, Sir, <clears throat> do you give... There's a famous prisoner here in Idaho who's killed about 40 people, and he's on death row, and he happened to be in the Ada County Jail at that time, and I said... Uh, do you uh, deprive that mass murderer over there of uh, soap and towels and toilet paper? Boy, you should have seen that guard. Uh, there was smoke going down the hall as he was going after <laughs> toilet paper and towels and blankets and 
You've only got one blanket? Yeah, that's right. And, and uh, I don't know why they're punishing me like this, but uh, <clears throat> they uh, threw me in here, and here I am, separated for everybody, everybody. And I haven't had counsel, and I've been asking every guard that comes in here if he'd help me get a lawyer and help me get counsel. I don't even know what I'm charged with, but for some reason my government has taken me and put me in jail. You think that guard's ever going to forget what he saw that morning? You see why it's so important to add a little theatrics and make these demands? Because, you know, if you're just the average run-of-the-mill prisoner coming through there, they're not ever going to remember you from one prisoner to the next. You need to do something that's unique and different. And let me tell you, standing stark naked in front of the jailer and asking him why you can't have soap is something that he'll remember if he lives to be 110. And that's evidence that I'm going to use against the jail and against my uh, person and against the deprivation of my rights. The act is already committed. Now bear this in mind. When the police entrap you, that's entrapment and that's unlawful. When you entrap the police... That's not entrapment, and that is lawful. The police, remember, are the guardians of the law, aren't they? Aren't they knowledgeable and trained in the law? Don't they know what your rights are? It's not my fault that the police deprived me of the essentials of life. I didn't tell them to do it to me. I just didn't tell them to stop breaking the law. When they're breaking the law, shut your mouth. And if they're not breaking the law, then suggest to them ways that they can. Are you going to beat me up and take my prints away from me? Maybe they will. Best thing that could ever happen to you. Let them beat you up. Make marks on you. Make sure that you get plenty of names. Two is all it really requires. But when they throw you in a tank with a bunch of other people, or when the guards come by, you ask them, uh, how's my eye? You know, how's my eye? Is it? Is it still as black as I think it is? You know, that's the type of thing that trustees will remember and guards will remember. How do you get these confessions and admissions? I'll show you that when we get to cross-examination. But let me tell you, when you get those fellows on the witness stand and you put the six officers that beat me up, five of them are sitting out in the hall, and we bring them in one at a time. And about two hours later, he walks out. Yeah, you can send Officer Smedley in. Now we'll talk to him for an hour or two. And you see, none of them know what you're asking them. None of them know where the lies left off and the truth began. And the jury is sitting there listening to the whole story as you're laying it out item by item. Can you imagine when the guard stands there and says, Yeah, I, I'm a temporary guard and I was there Easter Sunday morning. Uh, and what did you see when you came in? Yeah, I saw Mr. Gordon. And what condition was he in? Well, he had... Uh, he was standing there naked. See what you're doing? All right, now let's leave that scene and let's go on a little bit further down the road. Let's take a look at what our Supreme Court has to say about police tactics and police brutality. Take out the book that says Supreme Court Decisions 5. That's the book that contains Miranda versus Arizona. I want to give you a little introduction here to Miranda versus Arizona because it's the most significant civil rights case that's been decided in this century. As a matter of pro se law, the ex expounding of the Miranda doctrine, which so many people th seem to think is the Supreme Court's answer to uh, lawlessness. Uh, we're trying to create lawlessness. We want to turn all the thugs, hoodlums, and criminals loose on society. I remember when I first saw Miranda versus Arizona, I think it was in a newspaper about 1967 or 8 along in there in uh, Oakland, California, and the Oakland Tribune just chastised and castigated the Supreme Court for turning this vicious criminal loose on society. <clears throat> well, Let's understand something before we get for, uh, go forward in Miranda, and that's this. The Supreme Court does not turn criminals loose on society, and it's not their purpose, and it's not their job, and that isn't the issue that was before the court. The issue that was before the court was, can you beat a man up, take a confession from him, and use it against him? 
And the court said, no. And the reason the court said, no, was because if the police can beat Miranda up and take a confession out of him and use it against him in court, the police can take George Gordon into the jail, beat a confession out of him, and use it against him. And I don't want that. Now, I don't know what you want. You'll have to decide for yourself whether it's a legal question or a moral question is something that you can decide for yourself. What I'm going to instruct you on is this, that there is a difference between morals and law. If you're going to go into the courtroom preaching Jesus and Him crucified, at the same time you're going to argue driver's licenses and registration, you're so far off the wall and out to lunch, you're not going anywhere. So you better make up your mind to separate your religious ideology and your morals from law because that's the way the judicial system works. And you can sit there and say, no, it can't work that way and it's bad, wicked, terrible, and awful and we don't like it and we think that we ought to have a constitutional amendment against abortion. That's wonderful. That's political philosophy. Go take political philosophy over to the Congress and write a letter to your congressman, write a letter to your senator, write a letter to the president, but don't go into the courtroom with that kind of babble because if you do, you're not going to get any judicial legislation or any, I should say, judicial legislation accomplished. You're not going to get any judicial determination accomplished in your behalf, in your favor. And if you think that you can, let me tell you, I've never seen anybody yet go into the courtroom with babble. And I hear people going into the courtroom arguing Article 1, Section 10, why you can't charge me money here, why my goodness that violates the, the legal tender laws and the Supreme Court's decisions and blah, blah, blah. And those people don't even understand the money issue. And so they're in the courtroom, they're trying to argue constitutional law, and they themselves don't understand constitutional law. I can remember the first five cases I did by myself was from the left side of the issue. I was in the courtroom screaming Article 1, Section 9 and rights and Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights. And I've got a driver's license operating in interstate commerce under the police powers, guilty every time. I was just lucky that I had a nice judge that liked my issues and he didn't come down on me and throw me in jail. It wasn't because I wasn't guilty. It was because the prosecutor was unable to overcome my arguments. Now, getting back to the Miranda Doctrine, I don't know whether Miranda was guilty or not. I've heard the stories that he was a vicious criminal, a thug, and a killer, and he deserved to be put to death, and maybe that's true. I don't know. That's not the issue. The issue is rights. And where rights are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation that would abrogate them.